Welcome uh, to another Wallace Stegner Center uh, at the U University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law uh, Greenbrag presentation. Uh, we're very pleased to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Kiter. I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment uh, here at uh, the College of Law. Uh, I should note uh, that we're very pleased to be joined uh, this afternoon, not only with our esteemed uh, speaker, uh, but uh, C-SPAN will be filming uh, today's event, and we're very pleased to have them with us. <clears throat> the uh, customary way that we start uh, these uh, uh, events at the College of Law is with the Native Lands Acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Uh, this uh, will conclude our Green Bag series for this uh, fall semester. However, uh, beginning in the spring semester, the Stegner Center will be hosting a series of uh, noon uh, hour uh, green bag events exploring uh, Utah water law. Uh, that, uh, that lecture series, which is sponsored by uh, the Audubon Society, uh, is a lead in, in essence, uh, to our 28th annual symposium which will be on the future of the Great Salt Lake. As I suspect everyone in the room knows, uh, the Great Salt Lake uh, has uh, dried immensely uh, and uh, we all face uh, significant uh, challenges, both environmentally and economically uh, as a result of that. Uh, and uh, the state uh, is uh, making moves to begin to address that. We certainly hope uh, that the symposium uh, pro uh, offers uh, some meaningful solutions to uh, the uh, uh, challenges that are presented by uh, the uh, drought uh, and the receding of the lake water levels. Uh, today's uh, <coughs> Stegner Center Green Bag event uh, features uh, Professor John Leshy, uh, who's a distinguished uh, professor emeritus at the University of California Hastings College of Law uh, and uh, the former uh, solicitor uh, of the Interior Department uh, throughout uh, the Clinton administration. He's well-versed in a topic that he will be uh, speaking on, uh, which is actually the subject of his recently published book by Yale University Press entitled Our Common Ground, A History of America's Public uh, Lands. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Leshy, uh, in addition to uh, his uh, activity at the University of California, uh, Hastings College of Law, uh, <clears throat> is, uh, uh, has served as counsel uh, to the chair of the Natural Resources Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, He's been a law professor before joining the Hastings faculty at Arizona State University. He also served during the Carter administration as associate solicitor of interior for energy and resources. He served as an attorney uh, advocate with the Natural Resources Defense Council in California uh, and uh, as a litigator uh, with the US Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, quite a diverse career uh, and uh, that has exposed him to uh, various uh, levels and institutions within uh, our government. Uh, he also served uh, uh, as uh, the uh, uh, leader of the uh, transition team uh, for the Clinton-Gore uh, 
uh, administration uh, in 1992, and he was co-lead for the interior transition team for the Obama-Biden uh, administration when it came into office in 2008. Uh, he's visited at Harvard Law School, which is also where he graduated, uh, and uh, <clears throat> earned his uh, bachelor's degree serves on numerous boards and commissions, and has authored a book on the mining law, uh, as well as case books on public land and natural resources uh, law and on water law. Uh, his talk uh, obviously addresses uh, the uh, sweep of history uh, of America's public lands. And with that, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome to the Wall Stegner Center's uh, Green Bag uh, 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 program uh, today, uh, Professor John Leshy, uh, my friend uh, and colleague, uh, and we very much look forward to your talk, John. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. Bob is too modest to note that he is a very esteemed uh, expert and with many publications in the area of public land law. We've worked together and uh, known each other a long time, and I'm happy to be back at the University of Utah, where I've had the pleasure of speaking before. And uh, being from California, where we're in this epic drought, it's great to see snow on the mountains and feel the rain coming down. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. <clears throat> uh, my book is the first uh, comprehensive history of America's public lands. And by that, I mean the lands managed by the four big agencies, Park Service, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Bureau of Land Management. Uh, uh, in, in a long time. Uh, and uh, you folks in Utah know more about public lands, generally speaking, than most Americans. Uh, but still, uh, when you tell people uh, that the United States owns more than 600 million acres of public forests, lands, um, plains, mountains, wetlands, seashores, uh, deserts, uh, they're surprised uh, because you know, the celebration of private property and the distrust of government, particularly the national government, is sort of baked into our culture. Uh, so people are surprised to learn that. And when I give talks around on this subject, the first question I usually get is, I had no idea how did that happen? And so I frankly wrote this book to try to answer that question, how it happened. Of course, it, it didn't just happen. It, it came about because the political system, our political leaders, primarily in Washington, representatives in the national government made political decisions that resulted in the colors that you see on this map. And what those decisions were and how they came to be made uh, are the core of my book. Now, the heart of the story I tell uh, <clears throat> begins late in the 19th century because that's when Congress and the other branches of the government really began to uh, become serious about holding and conserving uh, significant amounts of land and national ownership. And that was after, I should say, usually long after the United States acquired title to these lands in the first place from Native Americans uh, and from foreign governments. Now, obviously, acquisition from Native Americans began soon after Columbus landed in the Americas, long before, three centuries before, the United States came into being. Once the US government was established in the late 18th century, it continued that process and went on to acquire vast areas from foreign governments, like the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, now, Native nations usually lost their lands through a process that began with their often brutal dispossession by an evolving cast of characters. Speculators, miners, trappers, and other developers, settlers, often backed by the military force of the European invaders and their successor, the United States. Acquisition of Native legal title followed. This was usually accomplished by treaties and other arrangements that while providing some compensation, could never fully make up for the injustices perpetrated or the enormity of the loss. My book doesn't address in any detail that process of dispossession and acquisition. Uh, it's a long and complicated story, and it's a very different story from the one I tell, which really begins uh, generally after all of that acquisition and dispossession had occurred, usually long after. I get a sense of that. Uh, here's, here's the map showing Indian reservations in the West in 1890, which was just before this, this big process of, of reserving and conserving federal public lands began. And as you can see, um, the, uh, uh, there was a lot of the, the, the white area are, are lands where acquisition of title had been settled. Um, 
Uh, I'll put it a little differently. The leading villains in the story of native loss of title to their ancestral lands uh, were settlers and capitalists, not conservationists and other protection advocates. That's not to deny that some of the prominent uh, conservation advocates, like most of their contemporaries, uh, regarded Native Americans and their cultures as inferior. And nor would I argue that federal agencies who came to manage these public lands uh, have consistently shown proper respect for Native Americans and their cultures. But the good news is that progress is being made in this general area, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on in my talk. What I want to do today is outline um, <clears throat> the major themes that emerge from, from my book, especially as they relate to Utah. Uh, and then offer some reflections about what all this might mean for the future. These major, I'm going to try to convince you uh, that uh, these major themes uh, demolish some common fictions that have grown up about these lands. The first and most notorious fiction is that uh, the public lands have generally been a divisive force in American life. Uh, one of my favorite examples to the contrary, and I offer many in the book, uh, is the so-called Weeks Act. But most people never heard of the Weeks Act. It was a, a, a bill passed by Congress in 1911. Uh, it was the first significant environmental restoration legislation in the US history. And what it did was it, it established a program where the national government would buy up uh, lands <clears throat> in the upper reaches of the eastern, midwestern, southern watersheds, most of which had been logged over, in, in order to restore forests and uh, uh, reduce erosion and help uh, prevent destructive floods. Uh, as this act was going through Congress, governors of the South, Southern states and the New England states joined forces in a panel to testify before Congress. And the governor of Massachusetts noted in that testimony that this was the first time in American history that governors from those two regions had appeared jointly before Congress to, quote, ask for something for, uh, for the common welfare of the United States. The Weeks Act and its progeny were responsible for most of those colored lands you know, in the eastern half of the country as shown on this map. Now the section, second fiction I want to try to demolish is that public lands uh, tended to divide Americans along partisan lines. Today we kind of view all issues of public policy as uh, red, blue, Republican, Democrat, but a dominant theme of public land history is how Republicans and Democrats alike have long agreed on the importance not only of holding more and more lands in US ownership, but also protecting them so that all can have opportunities for life-changing encounters with nature and can learn from and be inspired by the cultural and scientific resources on these lands. Here too, my book provides many examples. Support for the Weeks Act, bipartisan, Southern Democrats, New England Republicans. Uh, <clears throat> While some today uh, tend to regard Republicans as, as more, uh, less favorable to protection of public lands, uh, the GOP has supplied many heroes in the story I tell. Uh, and here's an, uh, another one of my favorite examples. Um, <clears throat> uh, this fellow, Fred Seaton, he was a Nebraska newspaper publisher and a Republican politician when Dwight Eisenhower appointed him to be Secretary of the Interior in the late 1950s. In that position, he protected vast tracts of Alaska public lands, more than 11 million acres, by putting them into national wildlife refuges, most notably the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up on the northeast coast of Alaska, which has been called America's Serengeti. So hats off to Fred Seaton. Now the third fiction is that, the most, that most public lands have been safeguarded through a kind of a land grab by the national government carried out over state and local op opposition. Claim is often heard in Utah and other parts of the Intermountain West. Uh, in fact, uh, however, uh, grassroots advocacy and support were instrumental in, uh, in uh, establishing nearly all of the protected public lands that we see today, including those in Utah. This was the case with the first big surge of decisions, reserving public lands in what became the national forest system. This began in the 1890s. It began uh, in 1891, Congress uh, responding to requests from the West, from their growing cities in particular, to protect the uplands that supplied them with water. The president, Congress gave the president sweeping power to reserve public lands permanently in US ownership. President Grover Cleveland, 
1897, the year after Utah became a state, Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, established the first forest reserve in Utah, nearly 900,000 acres, the Wasatch Mountains. Um, he did it with the strong support of Utah's first governor, Eber Wells, a Republican, who greased the skids for the president's action by withdrawing state-owned lands inside the, the proposed reserve uh, from sale and settlement. Then, um, <clears throat> between his ascension to the presidency after McKinley was assassinated in 1901, and he ran for election uh, for a full term in the fall of 1904, uh, Theodore Roosevelt tripled the amount of forest reserve acreage in Utah. And he did something similar in other states. And he did that, uh, and he told Congress this, he did it because he believed it was popular. He told Congress in 1904, and I quote, the forest reserve policy can be successful only when it has the full support of the people of the West, because the people who live in the neighborhood of these reserves will ultimately determine whether or not they are to be permanent. As usual, Roosevelt's political instincts were excellent. In the presidential election in the fall of 1904, he carried Utah by nearly 30 points. He carried other Western states, all other Western states, by at least 20 points, and won the national popular vote by 20 points the largest margin in almost a century. And then in the second term, in his, last, in his full term, uh, he more than doubled the, the acreage of the forest reserves uh, in Utah. Now, in the years after that, uh, leading Utah politicians played similarly prominent roles in safeguarding public lands and national ownership. The fellow in the middle here, Reed Smoot, another Republican, represented Utah in the Senate from 1903 to 1933. Primary sponsor of legislation, that established several national park, parks, including Zion and Bryce Canyon. And he was the primary sponsor of the legislation that in 1916 established the National Park Service. Um, Zion National Park, which I noted is on the cover of the law school brochure, uh, now hosts more visitors annually than any other national park except uh, the, the, the Smokies, uh, more than Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, or Yosemite. As uh, history professor Thomas Alexander, who long taught at that other law school down in Provo, uh, wrote more than a half a century ago, uh, the Utah National Parks and Forests had, quote, the hearty approval of most Utahns. And finally, to take another example, a fellow on the right is, is uh, Don Colton, Utah congressman, also a Republican. He was a leading proponent of the legislation that paved the way for the lands now managed by the Bureau of Land Management to be safeguarded in national ownership. Indeed, had he not lost his bid for re-election in the, in the uh, uh, depths of the Great Depression in 1932, what we know today is the Taylor Grazing Act would have probably been called the Colton Grazing Act. Around this same time, the 1930s, uh, Congress was expanding programs that it had inaugurated in the Weeks Act to buy private lands back into national ownership, primarily for conservation and environmental restoration. Uh, most of the protected public lands in the parks, the wildlife refuges, and the forests in that eastern half of the country uh, were acquired, by the way, from willing sellers with the consent of the states involved. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, the Everglades, South Florida, and uh, Big Bend, Texas, uh, two kind of iconic national parks. Um, let's look at this word. Big Bend and Everglades. Um, they were acquired by the states themselves from private owners with state taxpayer funds and donated to the national government so they could be safeguarded as national parks. Not a land grab. Now, fourth fiction in public land history is that it's really the executive branch of the government that has done most of this, with Congress kind of sitting on the sidelines. Again, facts are to the contrary. Now, it's true from the late 19th to the middle of the 20th century, Congress did give the executive pretty broad powers to hold and reserve and protect lands in national ownership. Besides the Weeks Act of 1911, uh, there was the Antiquities Act of 1906, as some of you may have heard about it, it gave the president broad authority to protect features of historic or scientific interest on lands owned or controlled by the United States and called them national monuments. Uh, that's kind of a confusing term. The reason Congress labeled them national monuments is because Congress uh, 
uh, wanted to reserve for itself the label national parks. Only Congress can make a national park. Congress gave the president the power to protect lands and just said, we're going to call those monuments so they won't be confused uh, with parks and uh, we'll get to keep our, our prerogative. Since the Antiquities Act has been on the books in 1906, every, almost every president, Republican and Democrat, has used it to protect more than 100 million acres of public lands onshore and many times that of submerged lands off the coasts. Most every time Congress has used uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, most every time presidents have used the Antiquities Act to protect public lands, Congress has later effectively ratified that action. Um, <clears throat> Uh, here's an example. Most of you probably know uh, uh, that for years, the Utah's Office of Tourism has run a very successful campaign to encourage visitation to what it calls, and in fact has trademarked, the name the Mighty Five National Parks. Uh, what you may not know is that four of those parks were first protected by the presidents using the Antiquity Set. This is not unusual, by the way. It's not, not, uh, not unique to Utah. About, there, are, there are 63 iconic places called national parks. Uh, half of them, roughly half of them, were first protected by presidents using the Antiquities Act. And then Congress came along later and say, slapped the park label on them so Congress could get some of the credit too. Now, starting in the 1960s, um, responding to a demand by a conservative Democrat from Colorado's Western Slope, a congressman named Wayne Aspinall, who for 14 years was chair of the relevant committee of the House. Um, he engineered and persuaded Congress to recapture a lot of that authority that they had delegated to the executive branch. Um, his first big success came with the Wilderness Act of 1964. There, Congress created a, very, a new, very protective category of public lands, in some ways the most protective category, because generally speaking in wilderness, you can't build roads, you can't use motorized vehicles, uh, you can't undertake extractive activities like logging and mining. Now, ironically, Aspinall himself was not an enthusiast of designating wilderness areas, but to him, the most important thing was Congress should make that decision. And so, in fact, Congress is the gatekeeper, thanks to Aspinall. Not a single acre can go into the national capital W wilderness system unless Congress has passed a law um, uh, authorizing. Um, <clears throat> what he did, and this is not very well appreciated unless you've worked around the Congress a lot, uh, what that did was to enhance the influence, the political influence of local representatives in Congress, the local congressional delegations. Because there's a long-standing custom in Congress that legislation does not pass that applies to a particular area unless the re congressional representatives from that area acquiesce. Uh, they have an informal veto almost all the time. There are a hand very small handful of exceptions, but that's the general rule. And you ask, why is that? Well, if you think about it for a moment, you, you got a collective body with geographical representatives. No, a representative from Ohio doesn't want to vote to ram something down the throat of a representative from Utah for fear that the same thing will happen to them. So there's this sort of unspoken agreement uh, that uh, local legislation has to have acquiescence from local, uh, local members. And that's what Aspinall did in uh, the Wilderness Act. Now, he seriously underestimated the support that would develop at the grassroots for limiting such intensive uses of public lands. Um, in fact, since 1964, Congress has enacted many dozens of pieces of individual legislation with the acquiescence of local members of Congress that have put more than 100 million acres of public land into the wilderness system, as shown in this chart. Now, the, the big upward tick in, in 1980 was the result of the Alaska lands bill. Uh, Alaska is so vast, 375 million acres, that it skews all the statistics about public lands, as kind of shown here. But the most interesting thing about this chart to me is the arc is always up. You know, you got one big upward trend, uh, trend in 1980, but look at what happens uh, after that. Uh, <clears throat> it's still upward uh, and still goes up today. Now, the Wilderness Act of 64 ushered in, in a, a new era of Congress spelling out in particular laws what uses can and cannot take place on particular areas of public lands. 
For example, since 1964, Congress has enacted many dozens of laws that give areas labels like National Recreation Area, National Conservation Area, National Preserve, National Scenic Area, and so forth. Each one of these individual laws sets out the terms under which those particular labeled areas can be managed, primarily by making conservation and recreation the primary uses of those lands uh, and limiting agency discretion by ruling out or strongly discouraging mining, harvest, timber harvesting, and the like. Um, all of these protections, it's worth underlining, were put in place because a bipartisan consensus favored them, including consensus in the particular places where these labeled areas are found. Uh, here's an example. In 1976, Gerald Ford, Republican, signed into law a uh, major overhaul of the law governing uh, the agency that manages more acres of public land than any, any other one, and that's the Bureau of Land Management. This is, was the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, which is inelegantly called FLIPMA. Uh, <clears throat> it adopted nearly all the recommendations of a, of a bipartisan body dominated by Westerners that Congress had established a few years before, uh, chaired by none other than Wayne Aspinall. Uh, likewise, the Congressional Conference Committee that put the finishing touches on that legislation uh, was also dominated by Western members of the House and the Senate. The broad thrust of this law was for greener management of the public lands managed by BLM. Uh, as my book puts it, one of the most important developments in public land policy in the last half century is how the BLM, long derided as the Bureau of, Lands, of Livestock and Mining, has, with the strong bipartisan encouragement of the US Congress, made conservation, protection of cultural resources, and recreation a major focus of its management. And this is captured uh, here. Whoops. That. The logo of the Bureau of Land Management. Used to be the engineer and surveyor and miner and all of that. And now look at what the logo is on the right. In fact, some have suggested that the Bureau of Land Management should now be referred to as the Bureau of Landscapes and Monuments. Now, as that BLM metamorphosis uh, shows, Congress is not generally uh, discriminated among the four principal agencies in emphasizing conservation and recreation of public lands. Thus today, all four agencies manage millions, tens of millions of acres of wilderness uh, and, and national conservation areas, and national recreation areas, and these other labeled areas that emphasize protection and conservation. And Congress has given each agency uh, clear marching orders to pay attention to environment and, and to uh, science in their decision making. And this is all blurred, kind of blurred the distinctions among these four agencies. The net effect today is that regardless of which agency is in charge, America's public lands are generally managed more for conservation and recreation than anything else. And, and this congressional activism in the last 60 years has also enhanced the durability of these protections because Congress har hardly ever reverses itself. Um, and this is sort of captured in this slide, which really does kind of sum up the major theme of my book. The, the solid line are the decisions by acreage to, to hold lands in national ownership or acquire more. Uh, again, always up. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, our, uh, and the dotted line is congressional, primarily congressional decisions to protect areas, uh, primarily for conservation uh, and recreation. The arc consistently up in both cases. and, and goes up today. Now, I'm guessing that some of you are ready to accuse me of painting an overly rosy picture of the political consensus on public lands, especially here in Utah. Uh, after all, conflict and uh, division is kind of the order of the day on just about everything, so why should public land policy be different? Um, now, I don't deny that the body politic has become much more polarized in the last half century or so. But my book makes the case, or tries to make the case, and I think it's a strong case, frankly, uh, that that has not significantly affected the overall direction of public land policy. Now, let me explain uh, with a very quick tour of history the last 50 years. In the late 1970s, some of you may remember, there was something called the Sagebrush Rebellion. It was given this label by a DC journalist who was looking for a snappy headline. 
Uh, it was promoted primarily by uh, uh, holders of permits to graze public lands who were unhappy with the direction of federal policy, particularly the enactment of this Federal Land Policy and Management Act in 1976. And what it did was claim the states actually owned the public lands. And a handful of states actually passed laws which, which made that claim formally in legislation. Now, rebellion sounds serious, but in fact, it never got any traction as a political movement. The states enacting that legislation never tried to litigate their claim uh, or take any other concrete step to enforce it. Congress never took it seriously. Neither did the executive branch, and neither did the American people, including the people in the very states that were ostensibly rebelling. Underneath this blast of hot air of protest, uh, the long tradition of bipartisan consensus supporting more protection for more public lands endured. It easily survived another hiccup when, early in his first term, libertarian economists persuaded Ronald Reagan to propose selling off 35 million acres of what he said was surplus public lands to help balance the budget. The proposal triggered much opposition across the country, including at the grassroots. Um, it found no support among Republicans or Democrats in Congress and went nowhere. Much the same fate uh, met the proposal of Reagan's first interior secretary, a fellow named James Watt, who wanted to issue oil and gas leases on tens of millions of acres uh, just about everywhere. Watt became a serious political liability, left office. Reagan, an astute politician, moved swiftly to the middle on public lands issues. Um, <clears throat> and here is an example of his moving to the middle. The big arc is, uh, thrust up is the Alaska lands bill. Then there's another smaller thrust upward. That was Ronald Reagan signing 8 million acres into a wilderness uh, <clears throat> with the Republicans in the control of the Senate in 1983-84. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, that was the largest single addition in any single year since, since the Wilderness Act was enacted in 1964. And Reagan went on to, the arc continues upward, went on to sign into law more, putting, legislation putting more acreage in the lower 48 states in wilderness than any president before him or after him. Now, in 1985, the governor of Arizona and future Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt gave a speech that kind of nicely captured what was happening. The last few years, Babbitt said, would be remembered as a time when public land protection advocates broadened their base, sharpened their message, and mounted a strong grassroots campaign to replace the idea of multiple use, which is kind of a well-worn catchphrase that was used to describe that public lands managed by the Forest Service and the BLM were fully open to logging and mining and other forms of intensive development to replace that multiple use idea with the idea of public use. Babbitt said that meant, quote, the new reality that the highest, best, and most protect productive use of Western public lands will usually be for public purposes like protecting watersheds, wildlife, and recreation. Babbitt had it right, and Republicans and Democrats got the message. Today, in fact, industrial uses like mining, drilling, and large-scale commercial logging take place on a relatively small proportion of BLM and Forest Service lands. The pattern held through subsequent administrations. 1994, Newt Gingrich uh, leads uh, uh, a campaign using what's called the Contract with America to take control of uh, the House uh, for the Republicans. Uh, it bristled with anti-government rhetoric, was totally silent on public lands. No surprise. The message of the contract with America was well, well polled in advance by uh, a brilliant uh, GOP messenger, a guy named Frank Lentz, who's still around. And he put the matter bluntly. He advised the GOP not to challenge what he called were, quote, the most popular federal programs today, specifically conservation of public lands and waters through parks and open spaces. The Republicans have generally followed his advice ever since. Um, the Tea Party insurgency in 2010 uh, led to a re Republican recapture of the House, uh, but did not result in significant eff efforts to roll back protections for public lands. Um, now, the Republican Party platform the last couple of decades has occasionally alluded to, you know, let's think about selling off some public lands. Uh, it's kind of a dog whistle to the far right fringe. Uh, 
But no serious effort has ever been made to put the, the, those planks into practice. Again, the, the chart tells the story, arc going up. In early 2009, President Obama signed an omnibus public lands protection management act into law. Most of its parts had been assembled earlier when the Republicans controlled the White House and one House of Congress. It put millions more acres in the wilderness system, established four new national conservation areas, and added three units of the, to the national park system. But I know some of you are wondering, OK, but didn't the Trump administration break that pattern? After all, wasn't its biggest splash to downsize the two large national monuments in southern Utah, the Grand Staircase Escalante and the Bears Ears, uh, that Presidents uh, Clinton and Obama had established? And didn't it make numerous other efforts to bend, bend public land policy toward away from conservation and toward more industrial expansion? To some extent, that's true. But I believe a good case can be made that Donald Trump correctly grasped that most voters who identify as Republicans in the West as elsewhere do not support either transferring public lands to the states or the private sector or stripping protections away from most of them. Consider this. In 2016, when President Trump was uh, competing uh, in a hotly contested race for the Republican nomination, and rivals for that nomination, like uh, Ted Cruz, were, were saying things like, uh, uh, we should uh, give full control of the public lands to their rightful owners, its citizens. Trump gave an interview in Field and Stream magazine, uh, a leading uh, uh, organ for uh, field sports enthusiasts, in which he explicitly opposed selling off public lands uh, or stripping them of protection. He called them, he said the United States should continue to be great stewards uh, of those magnificent lands. And once in office, he installed a guy named Ryan Zinke to be Interior Secretary. Zinke had gained prominence because he had resigned from the Republican Platform Commission at the convention in 2016 because it was considering a plank to um, propose selling off some public lands. And uh, Zinke resigned in protest. Um, now, Trump shrank Utah monuments, but he didn't abolish them. And he didn't tinker with any of the other national monuments that had been established by his uh, predecessors. And finally, and most important, before he left office, he signed two really important pieces of bipartisan public land protection legislation into law. The first uh, in 2019 was another one of these omnibus public lands protection bills. Added more than a million acres to the wilderness system, expanded several national park system units, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, its most noteworthy piece, by the way, uh, added protections to nearly a million acres of public land in Emory County, southern Utah. Uh, crafted that piece primarily by Republican Congressman John Curtis, not long after Trump had shrunk the nearby Bears Ears. Another component of the 2019 bill uh, ended Congress's 55-year-old practice of, of requiring, of putting an expiration date on something called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This is something that Congress enacted in 1964, which produces a stream of revenue for uh, acquiring, for state, local, and the national governments to acquire more land into public ownership for conservation and recreation. As a result of that 2019, 2019 legislation, uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund does not have to be renewed periodically. It's now permanent. The next year, Trump signed into law something called the Great American Outdoors Act. It made an even strong bipartisan support. It made an even more important change in the Land and Water Conservation Fund because since 1964, Congress had insisted that as the revenue accrued in this fund, Congress each year had to decide how much gets spent out of it. In 2020, with strong bipartisan support, uh, Congress made it a true revolving fund so that the revenue comes in can be spent out without further congressional approval. Um, that's been called the most significant, uh, important land conservation measure in a generation. Now, um, as you, most of you no doubt know, uh, President Biden restored the two uh, Utah monuments uh, about a year ago. Um, and also restored or is working to restore other public land protections that Trump sought to weaken. Uh, some of these efforts, uh, as you no doubt know, are being complicated by the war in Ukraine, rising gas prices, 
and all of that. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that most of those Biden actions, restoring protections, have not triggered much uh, backlash. Now, Americans have long argued about the role that the national government should play in American life. Uh, but my book makes the case that for more than a century, the public lands have been regarded as an exception to that general uh, rule. Now, of course, like, like just about every issue where a broad majority of Americans agree, there's always going to be a small, if sometimes noisy group of dissenters, uh, people who are hostile to just about everything uh, the government does. But uh, according to practically every opinion poll taken across the West, as well as across the rest of the nation, large majorities of Americans across both political parties want more and better protected uh, public lands. Uh, here's a sh slide showing uh, the latest in a long, uh, long series of, of annual polls that are taken by Colorado College, something they call the State of the Rockies Project, where they po poll Republicans and Democrats in every state and ask them a series of questions mostly about public land protection. Uh, and as you can see, um, <clears throat> um, Americans in these Western states of both political parties agree that holding and protecting large amounts of public land and national ownership uh, uh, really has been extraordinarily visionary and, and beneficial. So I think we've got to call this a political success story, showing that the political process is working the way it's supposed to work, where Congress responds to uh, and accurately reflects public opinion. And bringing more attention to success stories is particularly important in our polarized Europe, uh, where many are skeptical that anything good can ever come out of Washington. Uh, it's a major reason, frankly, I wrote the book. It's not creeping socialism. All who live, as you do here, in areas with abundant public lands know that they provide many opportunities for private enterprise. Uh, the continuing emphasis uh, <clears throat> on protecting public lands illustrates how tourism and recreational dependent businesses have become a major economic driver in many smaller communities in the West as well as elsewhere, making the economic contributions of traditional activities like mining, logging, and livestock grazing generally pale by comparison. In fact, um, uh, now, now, let me pivot to look forward. While this is a big political success story in my estimation, uh, the public lands face some major challenges. Um, We've all seen slides like this, whoops, showing you know, carbon emissions going up and up. The biggest challenges are obviously climate change and biodiversity loss. They're both global problems, and they both pose countless tests for public lands. The changing climate, among other things, alters the qualities, the natural qualities of public lands that are usually a major reason why we held on to them and protected them in the first place. Your children's Yellowstone, the New York Times said in a headline a while back, will be radically different. Public lands are invaluable reservoirs of biodiversity, but it's being threatened by what's being called the, the sixth great extinction in the history of the planet. Um, but the history of America's public lands, I think, can help inform how we, as a nation and a world, confront these serious challenges. Uh, public lands form, uh, uh, provide uh, vivid demonstrations of the uh, effects of climate change. Scientists are saying the glaciers are going to disappear from Glacier National Park within the next decade or so. Uh, this can help sound the alarm and arouse public opinion and stimulate needed political action. For another, more important, dealing effectively with these challenges, climate change and biodiversity loss, requires mustering the political will to decide that society's collective long-term interests must outweigh shorter-term, narrower interests. And the history of America's public lands shows how time and again our political system has done exactly that, preserving iconic places like Zion and the Grand Staircase for general public enjoyment and to uh, acquiring, reacquiring wildlife habitat, to uh, um, recover populations of migratory birds and, and uh, restoring forest lands in the eastern part of the country um, and doing other things like that, taking into account, acting in the interest of future generations. Um, I think it's uh, some of the best examples of thinking and acting in the interest of future generations that the American political system has ever produced. <clears throat> 
Because these problems um, are, are global, uh, the United States can take pride and should take pride in its historic leadership role in this area, uh, spearheaded by its public land policy. And we can see now the emerging global networks of protected public lands that include several hundred biosphere reserves and world heritage sites that celebrate nature, um, now found in more than 100 nations. Now, one other challenge, let me just uh, mention briefly, and that's the, the so-called ex recreational explosion, smashing previous visitation records. I mean, these, these, the slope here is steeply uh, uphill. It's wonderful that Americans want to recreate on public lands. We need to safeguard those opportunities regardless, for everybody, regardless of their bank balances. But it can be challenging to manage large numbers of visitors, recreational users, uh, while preserving meaningful visitor experiences, uh, and not so we don't love these lands to death, destroying the very qualities that, uh, that attract visitors. Um, and this poses, obviously, some new challenges. If you talk to public land managers today, instead of talking about how they're balancing, you know, logging versus recreation or things like that, the kind of traditional things they did, they're now talking about how do we protect wildlife and cultural resources and accommodate hikers and hunters and anglers and off-road vehicle users and geotaggers and climbers and wild horse lovers and bird watchers and target shooters and all the rest. There is good news on this front. The 2020 legislation that Trump signed into law established something called the Legacy Restoration Fund, uh, a major step to address the maintenance backlog and the, and the management of these public lands. It's been called the largest single investment in public lands in American history. Now, before I close, let me say a few words about uh, the symbolism of Deb Holland, the current Secretary of the Interior, being the first Native American to hold a cabinet post in American history. In the latter part of my book, as I mentioned earlier, I, I discuss in some detail how, starting in the decades after World War II, Native nations have increasingly demanded, um, and sometimes won, a greater consideration of their strong connections to ancestral lands that are now in public ownership. They have, for example, worked with Congress uh, and the executive to safeguard cultural sites, uh, exert more influence on how public lands are managed. And in a few cases, Congress has conveyed lands of special cultural significance back to the tribes. In fact, the interests of Native nations and the advocates for protection of public lands uh, overlap. Uh, not, not perfectly, of course, but they overlap a great deal. Uh, to take just one example, uh, federal land management agencies are just as it's happening in many nations around the world, drawing more on the traditional knowledge of indigenous people for guidance in managing these large areas, protecting biodiversity, dealing with the challenges of climate change, using fire as a management tool, et cetera. The nation's public lands offer many opportunities for redressing past injustices and healing societal wounds, and I expect a great deal more to be done in this area in the coming years. Now let me close by coming back to where I started. The political process ultimately sets public land policy. The future of public lands will be decided by officials we choose to govern us. The American people get the final word. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we need or have to have public lands. Congress can pass ordinary statutes tomorrow that privatize them all. Uh, no, no acre of public land is immune, not even iconic places like Zion. <clears throat> and Congress and the President can also starve public land managers of funds to grapple with the challenges that I described. That would make it harder for them to fulfill their stewardship mission, uh, which in turn undermines public confidence and with it public support for public lands. What it boils down to is this. Each new generation of Americans must effectively decide what it wants to do with these lands. Uh, without political support, they and the values they bring to our way of life will be lost. Um, put a little differently, the future will be determined largely by how Americans, including rising generations, such as are attending this law school, uh, react to the changes uh, now underway. There's some daunting questions. Will voters continue to support protecting public lands as climate uh, change takes its toll, as biodiversity suffers, as more and more iconic places on public lands become more and more crowded? What if rejecting rather than respecting the teachings of science become a dominant attitude? If, what if partisan rhetoric intensifies? What if voices get even louder and uh, minds become even more closed? If the American political system becomes more dysfunctional, 
Will candidates for political office, especially in places where public lands are abundant, continue to believe that protesting these, uh, protecting these lands enhances the quality of life? The answers will determine uh, whether the long-standing bipartisan consensus on the general direction of public land policy, this upward arc, uh, will endure or will it unravel. As President Nixon put it in 1971, the public lands give the nation's nation breathing space, a vast public asset that nurtures national pride, physical and mental health, a spirit of community in an increasingly diverse nation, and offers countless millions of people life-changing encounters with nature, at the same time that public lands tourism has become the economic anchor of many communities. Public land policy has also uh, admittedly tardily begun to better reflect societal diversity and to acknowledge past injustices. Although Native Americans, women, and people of color uh, were largely excluded from participating in many of the key decisions uh, uh, of public land policy in the past, that's happily no longer the case. These lands remain subject to the will of the electorate, a group defined more broadly than ever before, and, so, and these lands can help redress past injustices and again demonstrate our ability as a people to work together and find common ground. In his seminal work, The Wealth of Nations, uh, published the same year as the Declaration of Independence, the uh, Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, who was the champion of free market capitalism, made a strong case for the private ownership of land, but for a single exception. A great and civilized nation, he wrote, ought to hold and own and hold land for the purpose of pleasure and magnificence for everyone's benefit. That the national government responding to public opinion has heeded Smith's advice is a bipartisan success story deserving of celebration, a welcome counter to the political polarization and distrust that currently plagues us. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to try to answer some questions. John, thank you very much for that uh, enlightening uh, lecture uh, and for uh, sharing your observations about uh, uh, the trajectory of public land policy. Um, I neglected uh, when we, uh, before we started to advise everyone, both uh, here in the audience and virtually, um, that you can ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, making use of the instructions that are now uh, on uh, the screen behind uh, Professor Leshy. Uh, and if another attendee has asked uh, a question, uh, you can uh, put a thumbs up uh, icon uh, that you like that question, and I will proceed to pose questions to uh, Professor Leshy. Uh, I should also note uh, that the King's English uh, Bookshop uh, has joined us virtually uh, to sell uh, John Leshy's book, Our Common Ground, A History of Americans' uh, Public Lands. Uh, information to order uh, the book is online on the websites for both the Stegner Center and the King's English uh, Bookshop. With that, let me turn to uh, questions that have been posed uh, at this point uh, by the uh, audience, uh, and let me invite additional questions. Uh, but to begin with, uh, you're asked, uh, in this time of deep division, and given our extensive experience uh, uh, with that, uh, what are your suggestions for some types of reconciliation uh, that might uh, address and lessen uh, that division? Um, probably no surprise. I think uh, you know it's it would be helpful to sort of lower our voices and uh, open our minds a little more. Um, the the successes that have been achieved, and there have been many, as I. Uh, mentioned, uh, have usually come from p people sitting around a table and, uh, and, and discussing differences openly and seeing how they can be reconciled and looking for common ground. That's one of the reasons I called the book that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I think th the successes are ongoing. I mean, they're happening. There are, as I mentioned, uh, it's kind of ironic, but uh, you know, the year, two years after 
less than two years after President Trump uh, shrank those two, lar two large monuments in southern Utah, uh, Congress approved legislation spearheaded by the local Republican congressman that protected um, more than a million acres in, in Emory County. And that was done by this kind of quiet uh, discussion around, around tables uh, and finding the common ground. So I think uh, we've got a proven track record of how that works and we should just continue that and not be kind of carried away with uh, a sort of inflamed rhetoric, which is too often the case uh, on lots of issues, not just public lands issues. I'll follow that up. Uh, do you see then, uh, looking forward, uh, much of the legislation re respecting public lands coming out of uh, local uh, types of uh, negotiated agreements as opposed to any major national legislation addressing <laughs> public land policy? Sure. Uh, it's happening all the time. I mean, um, Congressman Mike Simpson got a bill in involving the Boulder White Clouds area in Idaho through Congress not long ago. Before that, uh, there was a similar legislation involving uh, other lands in the Owyhee River in, the, in southeastern Idaho. There's a Congressman, uh, Senator Wyden from Oregon has an active bill now that's being considered to uh, do something similar in eastern Oregon. So th this kind of stuff is, is percolating. Uh, you know, you don't hear about it, um, but it is percolating. Now, it is harder to get things through Congress than it used to be, uh, for sure, uh, but things do get through. Remember, I mean, 2019, 2020, were two huge successes for public lands that Trump signed into law, those two pieces of legislation I mentioned. So all is not lost is, is my message. I think progress is still possible uh, and, and likely, frankly. Uh, you were asked uh, uh, when uh, you were a part of the Clinton administration and participated in the designation of the Grand Staircase Escalante, uh, uh, National Monument. Uh, did uh, Utah's delegation uh, support that action? Were any concessions made to help appease uh, the uh, Utah politicians? Well, that's a good example because I was, you know, deeply, pretty deeply personally involved in that. When we were putting the monument together, um, we met with the delegation uh, and, and, and heard a lot from them about what their concerns were and how we might address them in the monument itself. Um, for example, I think the top concern was we don't want the Park Service to manage it. Uh, so Secretary Babbitt uh, recommended to the president and the president agreed to keep the management in the Bureau of Land Management. It shouldn't say uh, disrupt water rights. There's a provision in the proclamation that preserves uh, uh, and non-interference with any existing water rights uh, and on and on. There were about 10 things that the delegation was really concerned about. I think we had basically accommodated them in one way or another in the proclamation. What happened in the aftermath is also important. Uh, in the aftermath, we said in the proclamation, these, these areas have uh, a lot of state lands in them. We want to exchange them out uh, and give the state lands that they can better use more productively elsewhere. And we negotiated a big land exchange that involved hundreds of thousands of acres of state and federal land that Congress approved. Uh, Congress, uh, the, the Utah delegation said, uh, we want to tinker with the boundaries. And Congress, uh, we supported and negotiated a, a, some boundary changes, modest boundary changes that Congress approved in 2000, I'm sorry, 1999, I think it was. Uh, so in the aftermath of, of that proclamation, even though it caused some controversy, there was tremendous progress made on the ground in terms of, and Congress agreeing and coming together to, to do these these changes. So I think that's a good example of how the process can and, and should work. Uh, your uh, description of uh, general uh, collegiality and comedy uh, seems to brush over uh, continuing concerns about uh, the efficacy of agency management uh, in the interest of conservation. Uh, thoughts on uh, this uh, matter? Uh, you know, uh, I mean, this is government. Government it does some things well and some things not so well. And uh, I think the, you know, the, the history of, uh, there's room for improvement. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a slow process and it requires a lot of engagement by the public, frankly, uh, because agencies do tend to listen to what, what the public wants. And if they're uh, concerns being expressed, they will eventually respond. So 
Uh, nothing, nothing is perfect that the, the government does, but it does some awfully good things over time, and I would hold the public lands out as an example of, of generally good government working. Um, but, like I said, requires a lot of uh, public attention and engagement. And frankly, money. But again, good news here. I mean, these, there's a legislation in 2019, 2020 provide a, a really welcome, very needed injection of public funds into these agencies, which will enable them to do their job better. Uh, getting specific on a resource management issue, uh, how do you see uh, issues related to wild horses and burrows? <laughs> Uh, and how do we achieve more uh, management compromise in Utah, Nevada, and elsewhere? Uh, that's a really tough question. Uh, I, I managed in my many years in government to kind of avoid much of the, <laughs> as much as I could of the wild horse issue because it's, it involves, uh, it's complicated, it involves very passionate feelings, particularly by wild horse advocates. Uh, and it pits the wild horse advocates really against the livestock grazers is the kind of the the, the real uh, nub of the problem. And uh, nobody's ever found a good solution. Uh, wild horses proliferate. Uh, there's been a lot of attention and money put into uh, uh, contraception, which might be a, you know, an eventual, if not overall solution, at least kind of help bring the problem under control. I have no great ideas <laughs> about how to solve that problem. And uh, I'm hoping the contraception stuff can, can work. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, you uh, uh, mentioned uh, the fact that uh, the Native peoples were uh, on the land uh, uh, long before we created any sort of public land system. Uh, so uh, you're, uh, uh, just let me make sure I've got my question here, excuse me. Uh, the question is, why aren't uh, Native nations uh, given first priority uh, over all of uh, these lands? Uh, it feels like they should be given a more definitive role in the future of our public lands. Uh, it's a very complicated question, frankly, and I, uh, one I have been involved in in the past in my government service. Um, you know, I, I, I've also taught Indian law, so I know a good deal about the, the history of the legal developments. Um, <clears throat> there is no one-size-fits-all solution, I mean, the short answer. Um, you know, for, for those who say we should turn Yellowstone back to the indigenous peoples, um, the first question is who? I mean, there are, uh, last count I saw was 27 different Native nations have an interest in Yellowstone. And uh, I remember from way back in the Carter administration, one adage I heard when I first started working on Native American issues was, if you know one Indian tribe, you know one Indian tribe. Um, and, uh, you know, getting tribes to agree on something like, what do we do with Yellowstone if we got it back, it, it would be a very daunting kind of task. Uh, the progress has been made at a very local level, and progress is being made. Most of these laws that, are, that have passed regarding specific areas of public lands, many of them have involved the transfer of some lands back to the local Native nations, where, and it's negotiated. Uh, Congress can do it, but it's a political process, which means it has to be negotiated. Uh, but give an example, in the 1990s, uh, when I was at the Interior Department, uh, the, the Confederated tribes up in northwestern Montana wanted to take over management of what was the, called the National Bison Range, which had been acquired from these tribes back in the 1905, I think it was, uh, for money, uh, although there was some dispute about whether the price was fair or not. But it had been acquired from the uh, from the tribes into national ownership and managed as a bison restoration area. Um, the tribes wanted to take over management. We negotiated for a long time the terms of that transfer of management, not title, but management. Uh, and the Bush administration set all that aside. The Obama administration tried to revive it. Uh, there was still opposition back and forth. Finally, in 2020, I think it was, or 2019, uh, Congress was about to approve a water right settlement with that tribe. And, and basically kind of threw up its hands and said, OK, let's just give the tribe title to the bison range, uh, which they did. So the transfer, the title has been transferred back to the bison range because it fit into this larger political uh, framework involving the water rights settlement and that sort of thing. That will happen more and more, I think. The legislation I was just looking at last night that Senator Wyden has introduced in, in, to 
uh, add more protections to big areas of public lands in eastern Oregon involves a transfer of thousands of acres to, to uh, I think, the Burns Paiute tribe. So we'll see more of that, but it'll be negotiated at a, at a kind of a specific local level. But uh, I think more of that will happen. President Biden has uh, called for the protection of 30 percent of uh, U.S. water and land by 2030. Uh, can you uh, share with us the best uh, pathway forward on making headway on this goal? Um, this is uh, difficult. Uh, the, the first question, and the one that's been raised over and over again, and there's no clear answer to, is what does conserve mean? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you define it? Does it mean like wilderness and kind of truly protected from all kinds of uses, or does it mean something less than that? Do lands that are maybe not logged or mined but are grazed by livestock is that should that be considered conserved? All lands grazed by livestock or only lands that are better protected? Uh, so. Uh, really, that's a very complex question. I, I really support the idea, the goal of saying we should protect, uh, you know, a percentage of our land. We should make that a goal. That is something, by the way, the United States hasn't really invented. It, the, the, I think more than 100 nations around the world have basically endorsed that goal for their own territories, protect 30% by 2030. Ultimately, the goal is protect 50% by 2050. And this came from one of my big heroes, which is E.O. Wilson, this Harvard um, naturalist, who wrote a book of several years ago called How Do We Save the, uh, the book is called Half Earth. And the, and the question he presented was how, how do we really preserve this important uh, remnants of biodiversity around the planet? And he said, if we pick the right 50% of land to, to conserve, uh, we can do it. And that's where this idea of protect half by 2050 and then Tech 30% by 2030 came from. So it's a, it's a planetary, um, planet-wide kind of movement uh, that the Biden administration has signed on to. Now, getting from A to B is, is not that easy, but I, but I applaud the effort. And the details, to some extent, to remain to be determined. Uh, let's uh, finish up with one final question. Uh, do you believe our bedrock policies in protecting our public lands are nimble enough to allow for some modernization of the challenges and threats they face, including climate change and intensified use? Uh, do we need a systemic uh, overhaul? Well, um, abstractly, I would say uh, you know a systemic overhaul would be good. But if you look at the history of how these things work politically, and this and this is politics. Uh, it rarely works that way. It usually is incremental change, uh, a bit at a time, you know, carefully negotiated uh, with a lot of engagement by all different stakeholders and all of that. I think almost certainly we'll see more of that. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't think big, grandiose solutions and changes systematically are possible politically, particularly in this era. But incremental change is very possible and is happening literally as we speak. And that's what I would predict will continue. John, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, today's lecture, uh, for uh, responding to these uh, questions from our audience, uh, and for all the work that you have done over the years uh, for uh, our public lands and in public service. Uh, let me note that uh, John's book, uh, Our Common Ground, A History of America's Public Lands, uh, is available for purchase uh, through the King's English Bookshop uh, online uh, here uh, in Salt Lake City uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Professor John Leshy for this uh, very enlightening presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.